Uh, just a few disclaimers before I start. Uh, it's been said that I work at the IMF. I have to very strongly state that nothing I will say should be attributed to the IMF. Uh, some of the uh, things I'll say will be agreed with by quite a lot of people at the IMF, but some of them will definitely not be. So please uh, make that disclaimer uh, clear. Um, also, don't think that this is a Brit going to tell you how terrible things are in, the, in America. Uh, things in the UK are as bad, if not worse. So uh, we are sharing your pain. And also, I'm going to try and talk uh, without using too much uh, finance or economics jargon. But if I lapse uh, and say something like synthetic CDO without explaining what it is, then uh, shout and I'll uh, try and explain things. Um, we'll have got questions and answers afterwards, but don't let me go too long without, if I'm unclear, uh, and explaining something. Now, when uh, I was being uh, taught how to speak in public, uh, people said, you've got to start with a bang. You've got to grab attention. But I'm not sure that that's particularly necessary at the moment. The UK, US economy is expected to shrink by 3% this year, the, first, uh, the, the largest uh, fall since 1946. House prices have fallen uh, almost 30% since their peak. Uh, one in 10 mortgage borrowers in America uh, are in foreclosure or default. Uh, one in five borrowers have negative equity. Uh, shares have fallen over 50% from peak to trough, although they've recovered a little bit of late. Unemployment is now 8.1% uh, and is expected to go to at least 9.5%, perhaps 10%. 35 million jobs have been lost. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me when I was recently watching the Ken Burns documentary series on the Second World War, uh, the US government in real dollar terms in the, this year and next year is expected to borrow more than the US government did to finance the Second World War. One of the themes you'll pick up that I want to get over to you is the concept of leverage. This is a famous quote from Archimedes about physical levers, but the same applies in finance. Leverage in finance is the amount of debt you have relative to the amount of equity, the amount of capital you have. If you've got a lot of debt relative to equity, your ability to take loss, you're highly leveraged. So when I say that, when I say highly leveraged, that means lots of debt. But really, what, to understand what's going on is to understand the leverage cycle in, uh, on, in uh, the financial system. Quick overview of what I'm going to say. We'll run through the causes very briefly, these, because people have talked about this for two years now. Uh, it shouldn't be too unfamiliar to you. Uh, the consequences of what's happening and then where we are, we're facing a crossroads on, in, in various directions and what those are. This is the uh, list of uh, potential culprits that have been lined up. They're, I think in uh, Newsweek this week, they have the, the lineup of the 25 personalities that are to blame for the, for the crisis. Um, you can start with going back to even the late 1990s, where because of the Asian crisis in Thailand, Korea, and so on, um, Asian countries were convinced that this should never happen again. They, should, they would never be forced to go to the IMF uh, for, uh, to borrow money. And as a result, they decided to start saving rapidly and uh, accumulate large amounts of dollar foreign currency reserves. And hence, they saved and uh, effectively put that money into, the, into dollars, lowering interest rates in the US. Now, the authorities here could have channeled that saving uh, into productive investment. But essentially, that's what didn't happen. Uh, the Fed, uh, as a result of the crisis over long-term capital management, 
and the dot-com bubble uh, and uh, subsequent concerns about deflation essentially kept money, monetary policy interest rates artificially low in hindsight uh, in order to try and make sure that the economy didn't shrink. But the problem was at each juncture, they kept making sure that the bubble didn't fully deflate. And as a result, this gradually led to the assumption in financial markets that the Fed would always bail the system out from every crisis. Essentially, the Fed was too successful. It made things too stable, and therefore banks, uh, financial institutions, started to <coughs> economize on the capital they kept and the liquidity buffers. It's like thinking, there hasn't been a fire in the neighborhood for 10 years, I don't need fire insurance. Financial systems were starting to think like that. Then coming on, the Fed could have tightened uh, the regulation of mortgage lending in this country. Uh, they did so last year, and they didn't need legislation through Congress to do it. They already had the powers under legislation from the 1970s and 80s. Uh, but for various reasons, they decided not to do that and allowed injudicious uh, mortgage lending to carry on uh, for good reasons. Uh, there was political consensus to promote home ownership. So the proportion of American households who own their homes went from 65% in the mid-90s to 70% in 2005. This was agreed across the political spectrum. And the way you did that was to lend, uh, extend mortgages to households who were at the limits of affording those houses. That's essentially how you did it. Moving on, um, the investment banks and the rating agencies uh, implicitly colluded in keeping these risky loans uh, being parceled up into complex securities and then passed to investors. And the SEC would have been the primary uh, agency charged with their regulation and basically didn't understand or wasn't up to the job of understanding what was going on. However, the, the bank regulators missed the fact that a lot of the large banks were parking a lot of risk off their balance sheets, away from uh, the public gaze in um, off-balance sheet vehicles. Uh, they were economizing on their liquidity buffers, the amount of cash they kept uh, in case they need to pay cash out in a crisis. Uh, they missed how risky the assets were that banks were accumulating, so they didn't require as much capital against those assets uh, than should have been the case. Uh, you may have heard of uh, a new market called credit default swaps. This is a, a contracts that where um, uh, some institutions can uh, ensure the credit worthiness of, of other banks or other borrowers. Uh, that got out of hand, particularly with AIG, as you're hearing. And essentially, the, the big thing that just about everyone missed was that systemic, what we call the systemic risk, the risk of everything going wrong all at the same time, was being grossly underestimated. As I say, it's like this idea that there hasn't been a fire for a long time. We can skimp on the insurance, but that means that when there's a fire uh, and we've not insured ourselves, we've not invested in fire hoses and so on, when we have one, it's going to be devastating. It was that type of mentality. And things were getting risky, people knew that that was the case, but so long as things kept going, kept inflating, we were fine. Congress was to blame uh, in various ways, particularly the political consensus to subsidize home ownership through the tax break on mortgage interest. Uh, it was generally known that Fannie and Freddie were ex exceptionally undercapitalized and underregulated for the risks they were taking. Academics had been saying this since 2001. Even the IMF said it in 2003. Um, but there was a political consensus uh, uh, in, in the banking committees in Congress not to properly tighten up regulation there because of the idea that this would add to the costs of mortgages. Uh, and there has been uh, drastic regulatory inertia in Congress 
There are five banking regulators. There are 50 insurance regulators in this country uh, as a result of there being no political drive to actually bring things together and rationalize. And then finally, you can blame the various actors in the house purchase industry, the realtors, uh, the lenders, the brokers, even the, the borrowers who are willing to sort of commit soft fraud, uh, lie about their income, lie about the value of the house they're buying in order to get uh, the loans at the margin. However, behind all that, I'd argue that ultimately uh, this led to uh, a system that is becoming more and more leveraged over time. Now, I'm, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to show you a chart now that should scare you severely. This is the level of debt across the whole of the US economy relative to the size of the, the GDP, the, the, the annual product in the economy from 1920. So you'll note that it, this peaked in the Great Depression at about 300% of GDP, total debt. This is government, household, firms, banks. Then fell dramatically, obviously, in the, in the Second World War, public debt took over a lot of that um, as <coughs> private sector debt was largely eliminated and has gradually grown since then. However, since particularly the mid-90s, there's been a very rapid acceleration of indebtedness in the private sector, particularly households, so that uh, the debt to household income ratio has almost doubled in the last 15 years. And if you notice, the orange line is financial indebtedness, is financial companies. So this includes Fannie and Freddie, who are issuing bonds to finance mortgages, but also banks and insurance companies who are borrowing to invest in other assets. So as you notice, the last time uh, total US debt exceeded 300% of GDP was in the Great Depression. As I said, this is applied to households with rising debt secured against overvalued property. I'll just flick through these slides. This is the chart from the Fed's flow of, front, flow of funds, just in nominal terms of what the value of all the housing is in the US relative to mortgage debt. So as you see, as house prices rose rapidly, um, particularly from 2000, obviously mortgage debt was rising as well with that, as obviously as house prices, houses go up in value, you've got to borrow more to afford them. But also what was happening was that equity from that housing was being withdrawn, particularly through home equity loans and other secured forms of, of borrowing. So you would have thought that as house prices rose dramatically and the debt would have stayed roughly stable, then people would have been building up equity in their house. And uh, over the economy, houses would be more valuable than the debt. But this is what's happened since 1952. This is effectively the share of equity that Americans have in their housing stock after you've taken off the debt, all the mortgages secured against the housing stock. So on average, in 1952, this is across the whole economy, so it, no one borrower would have been like this, but across the whole economy, Americans owned 80% of the housing they, occup that they owned once you'd taken off the mortgages. They now own 43%. So essentially, there's been a lot of borrowing against the value of housing, and that's accelerated, obviously, as house prices have fallen drastically over the last few years, but obviously the mortgages haven't that much. Companies, uh, this was particularly the case in the dot-com bubble, were buying, were borrowing to speculate uh, in, their, in investment and buy back shares. Uh, they stopped doing that in the 2002, 2003, but then started again subsequently. So even though companies have generally come into this recession relatively well positioned in their balance sheets, 
some of them are extremely exposed, particularly commercial property companies and anyone that was in, engaged in a private equity buyout, where lots of debt was issued to buy the company private. So this is just a chart of how much companies have borrowed uh, and ha what they've done uh, with their share capital. So the top line is effectively net borrowing by companies, and that peaked in 2007 at uh, almost $2 trillion a year. Uh, but they've used some of that to actually withdraw equity. They've bought their shares back from the market uh, to, to pay out to shareholders. So they've, they've borrowed in order to become more levered. And then finally, the thing that was driving the orange line, the financial institutions, what's been going on is that all that borrowing and leverage has, has not really been, been done on bank balance sheets that regulators could see. They've managed roughly to keep the level of risk in commercial banks roughly stable relative to their capital. What's really been happening is that a lot of this investment and borrowing has been going on in non-bank balance sheets. Now that sometimes the banks were, had vehicles where they kept things off balance sheets. So Citigroup in particular had a lot of these. But also it's lending to hedge funds, insurance companies, and as I said, Fannie and Freddie, the GSEs, what we're now calling the, sh the shadow banking system. Now why does all this borrowing get done away from the banks? It's largely because the banks are reasonably well regulated, despite what I've said. Uh, the regulators roughly know what a commercial bank should look like. Uh, if you're going to raise deposits in this country, you have to uh, contribute to the deposit insurance scheme, and they roughly know what's going on on commercial bank balance sheets. And they keep the capital required against those uh, liabilities and assets relatively high. In order to make money, maximize profit, a lot of the debt was being accumulated on other balance sheets where there wasn't the capital required to the same degree as if it was being held on a bank. So essentially what's going on is what we call regulatory arbitrage. The financial system knows that if, a, if, it, if an asset is on a bank balance sheet, there's gotta be a lot of capital and that's expensive. But if they can park it somewhere outside the view of the regulators, it needs less or no capital, and they can make a lot more profit. So essentially, this is what's been going on. Debt has been moved away from the spotlight of where regulators concentrate. So always remember this sort of, not flaw, but limitation of regulation. We can keep on extending the boundaries of regulation, but that in, in, or inherently uh, brings about a temptation for uh, leverage and borrowing to go somewhere else. Just to note, just to illustrate what's been going on, this point about bank balance sheets and non-bank balance sheets. Uh, this is the share of total credit in the economy that is accounted for by banks and on bank balance sheets versus what's been securitized and that's put into securities and then sold to insurance companies, pension funds, and so on. So you'll notice that even though total bank assets have been growing, as a share of the total, actually from about the mid-80s, they started to fall off. That's the blue line at the top. So banks are becoming less and less important as part of the financial system. And of course, securities are be taking over that role so this is largely mortgages being packaged and put into securities, but also commercial loans, commercial property mortgages, credit card debt, auto loans, student loans, and so on. So until, and, and then just until a few years ago, the, t the lines crossed over, and actually more debt was accounted for by securities than are being held by banks. So really to understand what's going on, you can't just think about banks. I'm going to concentrate a little bit on bank balance sheets in a minute, but that's only really half the story. All the marginal risk, or a lot of the marginal risk, has been done in the securities markets 
not in banks. So this is a very different financial crisis than we've had before. The traditional financial crises are when you've got bank runs. And as in the 1930s, people withdrew their deposits from the banking system and you had bank collapses. That's happened with the savings and loan crisis. That happened with the third world debt crisis in the early 80s when a lot of the large banks in the US were technically insolvent. This is very different. This is a crisis of securities markets that have then fed into the banks. Now, just to get this point about leverage clear, leverage can be measured in generally two ways, and I'll put those there, total assets versus tangible common equity, which is what uh, the market is focusing on now, or risk-adjusted assets versus what the regulators call tier one. That's all jargon. You don't really need to know about that. Um, but just to note that, in this crisis, bank analysts and rating agencies are focusing on the top one. This is total assets. They're saying, right, what do you own? Be, just don't risk adjust this. Just say, what is the total size of your balance sheet versus the level of capital, the tangible capital that can, if you're going to stay solvent, can absorb loss. So this is the most rigorous measure of capital going. Unfortunately, the regulators had been regulated to the second one, which is a lot looser and can, can be capable of being gamed a lot and lot, requires a lot of judgment. But on that measure, you'll see that generally US commercial banks are leveraged 12 to 18 times. That means that if you've got um, $100 of capital that you put into a bank, the bank can then lend $1,200 to $1,800 on top of that. US investment banks have been lever leveraged a lot more, and European banks even more than that. So in, in one sense, the, the US bank regulators have been much more conservative than the Europeans. So that's what was going on uh, in the run-up to this crisis. US banks generally weren't allowed to leverage themselves up too much, but brokers in Wall Street and European banks were. Now, I'm gonna to have to quickly, to understand this, run you through a bank balance sheet. Sorry about this, this is gonna be very quick. I chose a large, well-run regional bank in the US, BB&T, to do this, purely at random. They're generally seen as, as, as reasonably healthy. I'll no doubt collapse tomorrow, but. <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed to be quite healthy. Just to note, this is how a normal commercial bank balance sheet looks like. You've got liabilities on the, on, uh, the right. You've got, this is the, the great tangible common equity, this sliver here, and BB&T at the end of this year, had, uh, last year had 4% relative to its total balance sheet of 160 billion dollars. It's got this other capital here that's a bit softer, and that supports these other, this other amount of leverage here. So with tangible common equity, they're leveraged on that basis 25 times. So we've got this sliver here. Uh, notice that in the main, they, they take deposits from customers and companies and make conventional loans here. So they're, they're taking deposits and lending to uh, homeowners, companies, and so on. They have very little cash on their balance sheet, 2% cash. So that if just 2% of these deposits cashed in on one day, this would run out. So this is how banks normally operate. This shouldn't come as a shock to you. If you all want your money out of a bank, it hasn't got it to pay. And this, in a sense, this is the function of banks. But then, if cash started running out, they'd start selling these liquid assets to pay off the deposits. So that's how a normal bank balance sheet works. Now this is, now we're coming on to Citigroup's balance sheet, and remember, you in a few days' time, as US taxpayers will own, over a third of this balance sheet. This is, a, this is effectively your bank now. You'll note that it's 
two trillion dollars, and that doesn't count all the off-balance sheet liabilities and assets it's got. After a lot of sweat from the Treasury and the Fed and so on, they've managed to manufacture tangible common equity of 2%. So that means that on this basis, if any of these assets suffer 2% losses, this is gone. This bank is bust. It's got other tier one capital there. And as you'll notice, it doesn't have so many deposits. Citigroup is not that much of a retail bank over its whole balance sheet. It's issued a lot of securities, so largely bonds and preferred shares and so on. Um, and as generally holds other securities with that. Doesn't make that many loans. However, it does hold a lot of cash, much more cash than the standard. Re this is because it's funding itself a lot more with securities and interbank deposits. So it, its funding base is a lot less secure, so it has to hold a lot more cash on hand to do it. The key I want to get over is the thinness of that there. Effectively, on this basis, Citigroup is leveraged 50 times. So it's got 2% of capital relative to the whole of its balance sheet. Right, just to also remember that, as I said, banks trans what we call transform liquidity. That means you give them cash that's liquid, and they go and lend it to somebody else that, uh, for a loan that could be five years, 10 years, 30 years. If you ask for your cash back, they'll have a small uh, stock of cash on hand, but if everyone wants their deposits back all of a sudden, they can't do it. As if you remember James Stewart in It's Wonderful Life, uh, you want your cash back, no, it's in another person's mortgage and so on. So banks, this is how banks operate. This is what they do in a sense. They transform liquid, liquid liabilities into illiquid loans. Uh, now their ability to do that, they can't do that infinitely, they have to, by regulation, have to keep a degree of cash on hand. Um, but the bigger this maturity mismatch is, and the more they go to the wholesale markets to raise cash, the more risky their balance sheet is and the more liable they are to what we call a liquidity run. That means people lose confidence in the bank and they want their money out and they haven't got it on hand to pay. Unfortunately, this chart isn't available for US banks. This is for European banks. This is just to show the increasing reliance of banks on wholesale markets. That means borrowing from other banks, borrowing from pension funds short term, borrowing from companies, borrowing from uh, insurance companies through selling securities. So banks have become gradually less dependent on you putting your money in as a deposit and much more dependent on selling securities to uh, outside investors. Now that's fine uh, so long as they match their liabilities with their assets. Uh, and it's fine so long as they're not completely dependent on those selling those securities. But the problem with this crisis is that those outside investors have lost faith in trusting the banks and did so after the Lehman Brothers collapse in great uh, numbers. And so that made banks much more vulnerable to this liquidity mismatch. This, they were coming with payments to make out, but they were having trouble raising cash in the markets. And once that happens, particularly to an investment bank like Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, they're effectively dead in the water because if they can't raise cash against the collateral they've got to pay out the cash requirements they're, they're, they're committed to, they're effectively, um, well, they're illiquid and will fail. They will default. They may be, well be solvent, but because they can't make the cash payments, illiquidity becomes insolvency. They fail as a result of that. So when Bear Stearns failed, it had, um, it was well capitalized, according to the regulators, it was solvent, but it was illiquid. It couldn't raise the cash to meet its requirements. You've got a question, clarification. 
Yeah, sure. Um, short term would be either deposits that banks are getting from other banks or from uh, central bank reserve managers or from companies. Short term as in uh, they could, it, 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 if a depositor wanted their money back, they could take it out that day or with a week's notice, sort of short term. Whereas long term would be um, selling a bond that's uh, more than a year's maturity. Yeah, yeah. Right, so having put these things together, I've led you to the top of the hill, the causes, the leverage. Now the system like this became more and more fragile and it effectively it just needed a push, it's like a house of cards, just need to take out one thing. And now that could have come from anywhere, could have been a, a bit like a Russian default or um, could have been a 9-11 more seriously or whatever. It needed a shock and in this case the shock was defaults piling up on subprime mortgages. And in uh, the fall of 2006, it became apparent that a lot of the loans that had been given earlier in 2006 were going bad almost immediately. So these, to, to, go, up, to go into the, um, onto the investment bank radar, a loan has to go bad within three months of being given. So to, for a mortgage to go bad, to default after three months, something seriously wrong has got to have occurred. That effectively means you've given it to a speculator who realizes the house is not going to appreciate and has walked straight away. So they started showing up in 2000, late 2006 and the first lenders, subprime lenders, started to go bust in the fall. And then that started to ripple into subprime securities a bit later. Now this is quite a tricky chart to understand, but if you just bear with me, each of the, th this is on the bottom axis, this is the months of which a loan has lasted, a, mor a mortgage in this case. And each line of the, each line is, re um, represents a year of that vintage of loans. So the 2001 line is the longest gray line and it says, what, what are the cumulative defaults of all the loans made in 2001 as they age, as they get longer? So this is essentially saying in 2001, which was a, a terrible year for defaults because this was the, the lending just done before the, do, uh, the re 2001 recession. These uh, defaults got up to 25% after about five years. This was a this is absolutely terrible. It was when it was clear that the, this is the 2006 vintage, when the 2006 vintage of loans started going as bad as the 2001 year, we knew something was really bad. But if you've noticed, 2006 has, is so easily surpassing the terrible year of 2001. So here we've got um, sort of middle of 2008, delinquencies of these loans, this is two months or more payments have been missed, over a third of the loans, of subprime loans in 2006 have gone, uh, are delinquent, they're not paying. 2007 is even worse. And these were just the loans made in early 2007. Uh, after the summer of 2007, there were no subprime loans being made, there was, it was realized it, it was, it, there was, they were so bad. The market shut down. Now notice this spike here. This is essentially the fall last year when unemployment started really ramping up. And so you then get this vertical line in these vintages. So now we're, of the subprime loans made in 2007, half are delinquent. Now the market is then extrapolating. It doesn't know where this is going because with unemployment rising, where is this line going to go? 
because the holders of the securities on which, that, have been, that are holding these loans are suffering loss as these delinquencies rise. Payments aren't being made. They're going to have to foreclose on the loans. They're going to get 20, 20 cents on the dollar for the houses. It's all terrible. So this is just to show that this is sort of, we're, we're into vertical loss territory. And this is why this is happening. This is the price of the securities on which uh, package up subprime. So this is just, say, 100 cents on the dollar for these securities. Now, this is an index of the loans. And the, the, B, the triple B minus is, is the worst rated tranche. This is where the real risk is. And what was originally rated triple A was never, never, never meant to suffer loss. That's why it was rated triple A. Banks were holding this and putting virtually no capital against it because they were never going to lose any money. You'll notice that the riskiest stuff started falling, uh, had already started falling in early 07 as, as those defaults started to come through. February uh, 07 was a big realization that something was in trouble. But then the big problem came in the summer of 07 when the best stuff, the stuff that was never meant to suffer loss, the market realized house prices are falling, unemployment's rising, this is going to suffer big loss. And from then on, it's collapsed. So that now in the market, what was never, never, never meant to lose money is now trading at 30 cents on the dollar. Banks holding this didn't have any capital to absorb any of this loss, maybe 1 or 2% loss. They're now suffering, if they mark this to market, 70% loss. So banks holding this stuff are basically have lost nearly all their money, and, have lost, and the losses here have eaten into their capital. Remember, the normal bank, if it's well capitalized, only has 4% capital against its assets. So it doesn't have to suffer a lot of loss against those assets to become insolvent. Just to note, actually, it might be easier if I go over here without the flag. Um, just to note that this has carried on falling despite efforts to think about um, postponing foreclosures. So the market here is actually very worried about uh, the proposals to adjust um, mortgage bankruptcy law because they realize that if more people become uh, bankrupt and are allowed to what's called cram down their primary residence mortgage into for in, in bankruptcy, this is what's going to bear the loss. This, over the last couple of days, has probably ticked up a little bit to about here uh, on the uh, recent Treasury announcement to, uh, to start buying some of the stuff. So that j that's what has prompted the problem. So we then got the dominoes falling as these sort of losses became apparent and the ripple effects started uh, sort of moving out from the subprime area. So the, a key event was in the summer of 2007 when because of subprime losses, a Bear Stearns hedge fund uh, basically failed, and as a result of that, that led to a certain um, European bank money market fund saying we can't value our assets, and then that started a ripple process in the fall of 07, where, people, where banks started to think, I can't trust other banks not to have this stuff on their balance sheet. Now, subprime was always known, at, called that in the market. So they have various categories of quality of loan depending on the quality of the borrower, so the credit score of the borrower, uh, how big the loan is relative to the value of the house. So if you're borrowing 95, 100% of the value of the house, that's obviously riskier than if you're only borrowing 50%. And if you're borrowing... a uh, so that the interest is very high relative to your income. So subprime was the riskiest form of mortgage lending 
to uh, borrowers who would, in the mid 90s, you wouldn't have given them a loan. Or it, if it would have been, it would have been 15 to 20 percent. It would be extortionate interest rate to cover the risk. Then below subprime, sorry, uh, the next quality above subprime is called Alt A, Alternative A, and that's generally for borrowers with irregular incomes, or was designed for borrowers with irregular incomes, uh, who could, didn't have a great credit score, but should, have, should be able to save up enough to make the mortgage payments, so they're less risky. Then you have um, jumbo loans that are just big, <laughs> Uh, relative to the size of the house or just much higher than Fannie and Freddie are willing to, the, the government-sponsored enterprise are willing to insure. And then you've got prime mortgages where these are meant to be the safest, high credit score for the borrower, stable income, uh, the, the debt to value ratio is 80% or lower. So subprime was always known as a category of risky loans. Why banks were prepared to hold the securities against them was because the rating agencies were willing to give a very high rating because lots of loans were packaged together. So $150 of loan were put together and only $100 of security were sold. And so there was a lot of margin for error a lot of loss absorption capacity. And then the, the top slice, the highest quality, should never default because the cash flows should always meet the, the best, highest rated tranches. Now, the problem, one of the problems with where we've got to is that rating agencies completely misunderstood how correlated, how, um, how the risks were going to come together um, and cause problems. Um, but also, essentially, this crisis is caused by the assumption that the US would never have a housing crisis. House prices in America, as a nation as a whole, had not fallen since the Second World War. Certain areas, California, New England, Texas, have had housing slumps but it's always been on a regional basis. The country as a whole has never had a housing crisis. So essentially, a lot of this, the pricing and the lending, was done on the basis that house prices in America as a whole will never fall. So we can take these risks. So long as we've got mortgages in California, Midwest, Florida, Texas, all pulled together, they're not all going to go bad together. So we can, we think they're safer. So it's, again, it's this assumption that we can, have, we can have a bit of risk here and there and there, but if we put them together, the system as a whole is safe. The components might be risky, but together we're safe. And that assumption has just been proved to be wrong. Now, interestingly, you could argue that it's because that assumption was made then all the housing markets were joined together. Lending standards went down in all of them together. And that eroded the basis for the assumption. So it's a little like sort of you, you, you rely on um, uh, a regularity or a, a, an economic law or whatever. Just because you relied on it, it changes it. It's that type of argument. So. I'll, I'll just answer that, but I've, I've got, I'll take questions at the end. But um, th there is a degree of um, complicity that has gone on in the process. So because um, 
lots of the agents within the chain were paid according to volume and not quality, and they didn't have to hold the loan for a long time. They didn't care about the quality of the lending. They just qu cared about the volume. Now that's applied to mortgage brokers, appraisers, initial lenders, Wall Street. And so they were trying to generate volume. I've got a, maybe a good chart, actually, if I've got, well, I'll go through, yeah, there it is. <clears throat> so what happened, this is all mortgage securitization, so uh, in the US in a, in a particular year. So peak year, 2003, over $2.5 trillion of mortgage-backed securities were sold. So the dark blue li line is Fannie and Freddie. This is government-sponsored enterprises. And because the Fed kept interest rates very low in 02, 03, there was a big wave of mortgage refinancing. Mortgage rates came down. Lots of people chose to refinance their loans into lower fixed rates. So this, this boom happened here. And this was largely done through Fannie and Freddie. This was safe stuff. However, the industry sort of got, got used to this amount of volume. And to keep people employed and keep profits going, you've got to try and keep volume up. And they managed to do it, over $2 trillion of mortgages being securitized in the next four years. But unfortunately, the good quality borrowers weren't out there. A lot of them had refinanced here. So what do you do to keep volume going? if you're a lender. You've got to start lending to people who are less good borrowers. So as you'll notice, the, the, the share of non-conforming prime jumbos, subprime, and elsewhere rocketed here to keep volume up. So this is the subprime boom here. Now then, so I'll switch to this one to avoid the flag. In 2008, you'll notice that it's just the yellow bar, which is government, Ginny May, this is the Federal Housing Administration, and Fannie and Freddie, doing roughly what they've done for the last few years. There is no subprime lending, no subprime securitization now going on. So essentially, we're now, for 2000, the whole of 2008, basically there wasn't a mortgage made in this country that didn't have some form of government guarantee or financing on it. No, pr there were obviously banks made the mortgages, but they then sold them to Fannie, Freddie, or the FHA. There was no private sector lending to stay on a private sector balance sheet without a government guarantee on it. So the, there is no pr private sector mortgage market in this country any longer. It is all, as a re you as taxpayers are backing everything. So to return to your question, to keep, <coughs> to keep the volume going, <coughs> uh, standards had to be loosened. <coughs> and the rating agencies... Um, <coughs> complied with this to a certain degree because they were paid on the basis of the number of securities they would rate. There are some incriminating emails uh, that have become public where individuals in the rating agencies are saying, standards are getting too loose, we're rating anything, uh, <clears throat> we're just doing it for profit. I'm, I'm sort of, on the, on the one hand there was complicity on the other hand, there were genuine statistical errors made. So they, they are complied with this general assumption that things were sa safer than in hindsight we realized. They got their models wrong. And some of the data they were being fed was wrong. So don't forget, throughout, to keep this chain going, lots of borrowers were complicit with their broker and filling in a much higher income than they actually had because they assumed that house prices were going to carry on rising. In two years' time, I can refinance, take out equity, and move on. <clears throat> so the brokers and borrowers were effectively 
complicit in soft fraud and deluding the rating agencies as well. So this is a, a sort of combination of not understanding the incentives going on in the process. So yes, you, there is concern about how much of this was understood by the street and being swept under the carpet. I think there's a combination of that plus naivety about the risk models and the incentives. Just then, going back, um, yeah, as we've seen, banks have very thin levels of capital, and as soon as they start taking any material losses, they're worried that they're going to start becoming insolvent, their capital is going to go. So you as a bank, your natural reaction to that is, first of all, I'm going to raise more capital. This isn't a big problem. I take credit losses sometimes anyway. So what happened initially was that banks raised capital to meet their losses from sovereign wealth funds, from the market, and so on. And capital was raised, fine. The difficulty then was that house prices kept falling, unemployment kept on going up. And there's concerns that the solvency of banks is starting to become a worry. And then what you do as a bank is you start selling assets or you stop lending. You start shrinking your balance sheet in order to preserve capital. So this is the problem. This is, banks are great on the upswing because a little bit of capital goes a long way. But the problem is on the downside, you only have to take a little loss of the capital and they have to shrink dramatically as a result. So this is a sort of great concertina effect. When things are going well, fine. But when things are deflating, you've got real problems. And then, of course, uh, I'll come on to the bottom, but as losses accumulate, no private sector investor is going to trust you. The only way you stay solvent is by a government balance sheet taking either the risk, the assets off you, or providing you the capital. Because only the government has actually got the finances willing to risk to keep you af afloat. OK, um, moving quickly on then, uh, banks and hedge funds tighten standards, sell off assets, interbank lending becomes stress. So that's the next chart. This is just the chart of interbank rates of interest versus the risk-free rate. And this got, uh, even in the, in the fall of 07, this was getting very uh, dicey compared with where it had been. But then with the Lehman Brothers failure, it just went skyrocketed up. No, none of the banks would trust each other. Uh, then we had bond insurers getting downgraded. They'd insured a lot of these risky assets and accumulated a lot, lot of the risk together. As we said, we had li liquidity runs. You had failures of certain institutions, IndyMac, Washington Mutual being the biggest. Fannie and Freddie needed a bailout and being, were, were took over by the Treasury. You essentially, you had a delayed impact on equity markets and the world economy. Until about the autumn, equity markets had drifted lower but hadn't really got it, hadn't really understood how serious this was. Credit markets had understood the seriousness of the, of the problem and credit spreads had been very wide uh, from the fall of 07. Equities hadn't really understood this. And so it was only until after the Lehman Brothers failure that share prices started really getting hit, particularly bank share prices. Then you, uh, obviously, you now know that systemic guarantees had to be given to, um, from the um, deposit insurer to guarantee uh, bank borrowing and bank uh, bond issuance. Various bailouts, AIG, Citigroup, Bank of America, um, and the government started schemes to either buy assets or inject equity into banks. Finally, the Fed started a few weeks ago printing money or uh, announced that it was going to start doing that. That means the Fed was effectively going to start buying treasuries and other securities in the market, but creating um, bank deposits to do that, to finance it. So effectively, this is printing money. This is just the Fed's balance sheet over this crisis. You'll notice that it had been very stable at about three quarters of a trillion dollars up until the crisis. 
uh, then started to repo out a lot more of its treasuries to the market and uh, started to provide liquidity to the street uh, in, in much greater size. But then around the Lehman uh, episode, it then had to start using its balance sheet to overcome problems in the foreign currency markets, started acquiring other assets. So notice the Fed's balance sheet has gone from three quarters of a trillion to two and a quarter trillion uh, in, what, four months. However, that's not the end of the story because this is where it's projected to go. This is where we roughly are now. If all the Fed's announced facilities are used, uh, it will go to four and a half trillion dollars. So this is effectively, this is the central bank. This is effectively the treasury uh, insures the Fed's balance sheet. So this is, in a sense, you, the taxpayer's bank. It will probably get most of this money back. And we're not saying that uh, a lot of this is, is going to be lost. It's just saying that effectively the Fed is having to substitute its balance sheet and buy assets and lend against assets that the market wants to sell. So as the, as the banks and the shadow banking system wants to de-lever, wants to shrink, if they did that and to the degree they wanted, they'd be selling lots of securities at very low prices. Effectively, the Fed is inflating its balance sheet to cushion the fall. It's trying to keep asset values up so that um, banks can, and others can sell. One analogy is as, as if um, this is a mining operation. The private sector has mined very deeply, and the shafts are starting to cave in. The Fed is propping up with its balance sheet the shafts to allow the miners to evacuate, trying to, trying to hold the shafts up uh, whilst uh, the private sector gets out. Now, this is one of the effects of what's going, what the Fed is doing. Uh, you'll notice that despite low inflation, very low interest rates, mortgage rates in the US hadn't really fallen that much. And, and, and actually, the riskiness and falling house prices had, had forced mortgage rates up. Until the Fed, uh, around end of 08, decided to announce that it was going to start buying uh, mortgage-backed securities. So effectively, it was going to start subsidizing uh, the, the making of loans uh, to the US housing market. And this is where, this big four here is where it announced a further increase in that program. So it, it had an initial effect, I think it was there. Uh, market still had gone back up. Uh, and then with a further announcement, it's, it's, the Fed is basically forcing mortgage rates down to 5%. Probably wants to get them down to four and a half but weigh that when you think about refinancing yours. Now, but notice, uh, this is the prime rate. No, sorry, this is the jumbo rate. So if you've got a big loan relative to the size of your house, you're not enjoying much of this yet at all. And your rates, if you've got a, trying to buy a big house with a big mortgage, your rates have gone up because the risk of that is much higher because house prices are falling. And defaults on jumbo mortgages are still very high. So the problem is that you can force rates down, but will people want to borrow? And with house prices falling still at 10 to 15, 20% a year, are you willing to actually buy, borrow to buy a house even at 5%? So consequences of all this, sharp rise in delinquencies and unemployment, quick chart, this is the blue line is unemployment, and the blue line is US unemployment relative to Japan, UK, Euro area, and Canada. Much faster rise than elsewhere. Other countries have got unemployment problems, but US is rising much quicker. This is total delinquencies across the whole of um, mortgages. This is every mortgage, not just subprime. This is foreclosures, shooting up to 3%. This is uh, the worst it ever got in the Great Depression was 35 this is, I think, the scariest chart. This is unemployment relative to the last two recessions. So this is uh, 1990 recession. This, this is months across here. And this is when the recession started. So by about here, uh, 
1990, 2000, and now, job losses have been roughly equivalent. But by about now, things would have started to bottom out in job losses. Uh, the fact that we're still heading south is um, extremely troubling. So this is a three and a half million job loss from the start of the recession. So other consequences, the disappearance of the broker dealers. Uh, if you may not have noticed that now uh, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers no longer exist. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs have had to become banks in order to protect themselves from uh, liquidity runs. So there, there, is no, there are no broker dealers, big broker dealer firms on Wall Street left. The business model is gone. Uh, there will be uh, regulatory transformation, and I'll come on to this later on. I'll try and speed up. Uh, there are now substantial fiscal risks on the government's balance sheet uh, through the Fed, the Treasury, the FDIC, the FHA, and other entities that you won't have heard about, things like the federal home loan banks. That's effectively a trillion dollars of uh, lending to the mortgage industry. Uh, this is not... Um, a, a, a alarmist, uh, both the UK and the US and other sovereign raters that are sovereign borrowers uh, that have been always rated AAA, those ratings are at least now in question. The rating agencies are saying we've still got a long way to go before we downgrade the US or the UK, uh, but we're starting to think about it. We're starting to think what it would take. And don't forget Japan was downgraded from AAA to uh, AA uh, in 1998. Uh, it's, I'll show you a chart later, but it's worth noting that market indicators of credit worthiness put McDonald's as a better credit risk than the US government. So also you've got tightening of credit standards, and uh, as we know, the stock market fall, and that has a, an impact on the real economy because cost of capital to business rises, more costly to invest, and so on. And we'll see uh, a major extension of federal influence over banks. Now, that's coming partly through direct capital investments and the TARP and so on. Uh, but we'll, there'll also be much tighter regulation coming, much more capital needed in banks. Just a quick indicator of what it's doing to the real economy. This is the stock uh, of auto inventories uh, relative to monthly sales. So if you notice now, the auto industry is stockpiling six months of sales. Uh, not surprising GM isn't making any money because effectively we don't need to make another car for six months. So this is an indication of um, uh, credit worthiness of sovereign country borrowers. As you'll notice, this isn't just a US problem. Lots of European countries have this problem as well. The, the US is the red line. It's come back in a, a bit recently, sort of equivalent to Germany. UK is, is up here. So the higher up it is, the, wor the worse the market thinks the credit risk is. Right, we're now at a crossroads. This is the likely outcome. This is the likely road taken, uh, equivalent to what's called the Japanese lost decade. So from uh, the early 90s to the early 2000s, Japan went, ha had this credit bubble that burst. Uh, it had to rescue banks, uh, and government debt uh, skyrocketed, but growth and inflation were very low. So what's likely to happen is that banks are going to need to hold much more capital and liquidity. That means that the, the cost to borrow from banks is going to be much higher in the future. The spread they're going to charge over the Fed's interest rate is going to be much higher. Hence, everything that needs to borrow from banks is going to cost a lot more. Investment is going to be costly. Mortgages are going to be more costly. Therefore, it's not surprising that asset values that require borrowing to keep them financed have all fallen 30 to 50% in value. The market sees 
the cost of capital has just shot up in the future, and therefore asset values have got to fall as a result. We might well get a lot more government influence over the direction of lending. This is happening in, in a soft way, so City Group is doing certain things that it wouldn't choose to do commercially, largely because the government has bailed it out. This is definitely happening with the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. They are uh, taking on a lot more risk and they are foreclosing on a lot fewer loans than they would do commercially in or because of much more political direction. Uh, we're probably at the state where it's impossible to start withdrawing government support. If you remember the mine shaft, the Fed and the Treasury are propping up the mine, but they haven't acknowledged yet that the mine shafts are too deep. They've got to be abandoned. There's too much debt in the system, too much leverage. So if you hear the Treasury Secretary, the Fed, and so on, they always keep on talking about re-establishing liquidity in the markets, getting credit flowing again. They still want to keep things moving, keep borrowing going, not deflate the debt mountain. Because if they know if, they, if that happens, there's going to be a lot of banks go bust as a result, and probably a lot of insurance companies go bust as a result. So the rhetoric is we've got to keep the mine shafts open. Don't close the mines. Uh, we like financial activity at this depth. It's, it, it's fine. Once they start acknowledging that problem, then we're closer to the, to the end of the crisis, but the road could get very rocky. Uh, you'll see a lot more consolidation of banks, uh, and, uh, and obviously that's happened already uh, with rescue mergers. Uh, probably more to go. Now, the, the other thing that the authorities have not yet acknowledged is that it's been big banks that have got us into this trouble, and we should be moving to a position where you don't have an institution that is too big to fail, that is, that is too difficult to let go down. Sheila Baer, the head of the uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation, has started to talk about that, but no one else has. And one thing you need to start thinking about is how to start breaking up the big institutions so that you can afford to allow them to fail, so that we don't have Bank of America with $2 trillion of assets and know that if that goes insolvent, the whole system is in deep trouble. But the really scary thing is that this is chicken feed compared to the threat of, to fiscal solvency of, first of all, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, because effectively now you own those, that has doubled the level of public debt in the US. Then there's another five trillion of unfunded veterans benefits that haven't been paid for. Then there's $40 trillion of unfunded Medicare and Social Security benefits that are effectively promised over the next 75 years. So, the borrowing over the next two years, $3 trillion, $4 trillion, is obviously substantial. But in terms of the fiscal problems to come, it is as yet nothing. The other road you could go is to sort of acknowledge that the, the economy is over leveraged and to start trying to do something about it. Now, if you're going to do this, you might, as I said, start breaking up the large institutions or incentivizing them to break themselves up. Now, how you do that is to say, the bigger you are, the more complex you are, the more connected you are to it, the whole of the system, the more capital I want from you. So we know that we're gonna have, have a lot more capital anyway in banks, but you then start penalizing them the bigger they get. What we haven't understood or haven't realized is that Bank executives do not get paid, in the main, on profitability. Bank executives get paid on the size of their institution. Consequently, bank executives have a vested interest in making their institution as big as possible. It doesn't have to be profitable, just as long as it's big. It also means that if they get in trouble, it's more likely that the government is going to have to come in and bail them out because they're so big 
why we haven't understood this. This is in the economics literature and finance literature. So therefore, you need, the authorities need to do something to countervail that problem. At the moment, all the debate about remuneration has been to link more closely management remuneration to profitability and risk-adjusted profitability. But it's still not going to solve this issue of size. And you need to start incentivizing bank managers to break up their institutions and get smaller. Corporate breakups are well known. This is one obvious thing to do. You could go even further and start breaking up banking functions and what's called in the literature narrow banking, that is just taking current accounts and parking it in money market instruments, taking no risk and just operating a payment system and then allowing people to have savings accounts where they take risk and they know they're taking risk and they're not guaranteed and you could lose some of your money. And this has been advocated since the 1930s by radical bank theorists like me uh, as a way to stop this point about banks needing to be bailed out. Effectively, what banks do, because they blend the payment system with the savings intermediation, this uh, taking savings and then lending it out, there's, they say, if we get in trouble, the payment system gets it. They're holding the economy, the payment system, ransom to force taxpayers to ultimately bail them out in a crisis. One way to stop that is to say, make my day. We'll allow you to go bust so long as the payment system is secure. There, there would be costs of doing that, but that's one way of doing it. Now, this is going to make me very popular, <laughs> is to start saying, well, how do you start, stop the leverage in the system is to stop subsidizing it through the tax system. Just about every country in the world allows companies to deduct interest payments before they pay corporation tax, but not dividends on shares. And there's complications with capital gains. So every limited liability company in the world generally has an incentive to leverage itself up as much as is prudent because if it does so and things go well, its shareholders make tons of money and it minimizes its tax, its corporation tax payments. But if things go badly, all the shareholders lose is their money. Their li li liability is limited. So there is already a skew in the system to incentivize companies to borrow to maximize shareholder gains on the upside and walk away from the losses on the downside. We then add to that system by a subsidy through the tax system. It's like um, the, the tax man, the IRS, uh, giving people subsidies before they go into um, Las Vegas slot uh, casinos. That also happens with mortgages. So your debt interest payment on mortgages, on, on your mortgage is deductible. That gives you an incentive to, first of all, do your, all your borrowing via your house. So this is why home equity loans have got so popular. Credit card debt has grown, but it's not exploded. It's actually the home equity loans that have exploded because you get a tax deduction. People that respond ultimately to price signals. Now, I'm not saying remove this now and take house prices down another 5 or 10%. But once the system is stabilized, and house prices stop falling, you need to start gradually removing this tax break so as you don't give people an incentive to speculate on the upside and give them a tax break to do so. Got to think about non-debt forms of house purchase. This is, dare one say it, what Islamic banks have been doing, how they structure non-interest mortgages, is effectively to uh, rent to the occupier, the part of the house they don't own yet, and you can gradually pay over the rental value to accumulate equity. The flows may be the sa exactly the same as with a mortgage, but when things go wrong, the distribution of risk is different. So if you've accumulated 50% of equity in your house, 
uh, you need to sell it because you can't afford the rest of the payments or the rent. You just sell it and divide the proceeds with the bank. You have far less incentive to borrow a lot to speculate on the upside. But these, that type of arrangement doesn't get off the ground because you give a tax break to mortgage interest. And finally, financial education. This is not just in the UK, US, but the UK and all over uh, the Western world. People are expected more and more to take financial responsibility for themselves, for their pensions, for their health care, and so on. But they are woefully uh, ill-equipped to do so when they leave school or college. There was a, uh, just to illustrate the, the vulnerability of American households, there was a survey done by an insurance company recently that reported that 22% of American households were two weeks away from default. That means that if they lost their job, they would start defaulting on their debt within two weeks. Another 28% would start defaulting within a month. So effectively half, and these were survey respondents, half of American households would be in default within a month. They had that little gap of, of savings to fall back on, liquid savings. And this has got to be rectified. Now the problem is the industry won't do it because educated consumers is, is not what the financial industry wants. <laughs> because the way you make money in finance is by charging high margins from inert consumers. And they, don't want, they won't pay for this to educate you. Some insurance companies may do to get you into their product. Uh, government doesn't, doesn't seem to want to do a great deal in this area, but this has got to change. Revealed weaknesses of the US political model. This is where, this isn't just a Brit set, saying this. This is just examples from this uh, episode. Um, federal versus state doesn't work when you're trading financial services across the whole of the country. So as I said, we have 50 insurance regulators in this country. There is, there is a coordinating body, but there's no international voice for American insurance companies. Mortgage broking is the same, and that was one of the problems. There is protection in Congress of incumbents. So we have two securities regulators in this country, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission that does futures markets, and the Securities Exchange Commission that does uh, securities markets. They've not been merged because the futures market started in Chicago trading wheat futures. And therefore, the Agriculture Committee in Congress has oversight of futures and will not give up the oversight of financial futures to the SEC. Barney. There is an endemic inability to tackle long-term problems. As we've mentioned, entitlements is one of those. Uh, we haven't really talked about the underfunding of pensions, both at company and state and federal level. But after the stock market fall and the fall in interest rates, uh, company pension funds are about a third underfunded. That means their liabilities are about a, uh, a third higher than their assets now. Uh, and that's pretty much the same at state and local level. We, c we can't seem politically to take pain now when we can postpone it to the future. And we don't have the constraints on the politicians and the electorates to stop voting for postponement of pain. We have problems with the dominance of lobbying of commercial interests. The worst example of this is Fannie and Freddie on the Hill before they were taken over. If there was any attempt to tighten up regulation of those, there was a lobbyist within a congressman's office within 30 seconds. They paid off both sides on the Senate Banking Committee, uh, the House uh, Relevant Banking Committee. And if you notice that where Fannie and Freddie's social housing projects are all cited, it just so happens to coincide with the constituencies of every member of the Senate Banking Committee and the House Committee. <laughs> 
administration turnover and appointments is being shown as a real problem now. In the middle of this horrendous crisis, effectively, there was a, a, a sort of no government in charge for two months between the election and uh, the inauguration. And we still only have one secretary in the Treasury uh, at the time of perhaps the worst um, post-war financial crisis. Um, this seems bizarre to me. Um, there is short-term populism breaking out in one sense, understandably, because the politicians have promised a lot but not fixed it, and so the problem keeps coming back. They haven't acknowledged how big the problem is, and so therefore there's uh, frustration amongst the electorate that this keeps coming back. We're, pe we're paying out huge sums, and we haven't fixed the problem. Uh, that's partly because uh, we haven't the courage to admit how big an issue this is. Unfortunately, there is a creeping tendency and willingness to break contracts starting to come in. So there is a piece of legislation before Congress on personal bankruptcy that says, essentially, you had contract, financial contracts on mortgage securitization, but for purposes of public policy, we are going to overwrite them. So essentially, Congress is saying, we are going to overwrite contract law for the purposes of public policy. This is a terrible precedent for the future because who, are, who is going to trust you if this goes through in the future? You're going to want foreign capital to come here. If they can't trust contracts, uh, then they'll, they'll charge a lot more in order to come. I'll just note that uh, this is getting close to um, the expediency that happened in 1933 when just remember that the US government did default on its debt in 1933. Because treasury debt up until then was convertible into gold at the holder's behest. Congress passed a law that says, sorry, retrospectively, you don't have that option. That would have been, that would now constitute a credit event, that would be a default. So don't think the US has not defaulted on its debt. It did, and basically uh, took uh, bondholders for about 25 cents in the dollar as a result. Conclusions. Once in a lifetime transformation of financial institutions is going on. A radical overhaul of US banking regulation is now coming. The problem is I don't think it's going to be radical enough in it tackling the real problems about leverage. There is a rare chance to change the approach to home ownership, but I don't think it's going to be taken. The vested interest in keeping house prices up is too great. Uh, there is, I see, a return to thrift. People have realized they're now overborrowed. There's going to be a lot of tax coming in the future that they're going to have to pay. So you're starting to save like crazy. So whereas it had been China and Japan doing the saving for you in the early part of this decade and investing in, in US assets so that American households essentially saved nothing for three years in the middle of this decade, now all of a sudden the savings rate has started to shoot up. And I would expect it back to 8 or 10% soon. A major worry is that as everyone is in such trouble who's borrowed money, it's going to become much more um, socially acceptable to go through bankruptcy. This is the nightmare scenario for the banks. If you're thinking everyone's walking away from their house, I'm in negative equity, there's no point in carrying on, I'm posting the keys in and I'm walking. Uh, if that starts, if, that, uh, if bankruptcy becomes much more acceptable, then um, the financial system is the government's. Huge fiscal risk looming in the short and long term. The reserve status of the US dollar is now under question. China, a few, few weeks ago, questioned and wanted assurances on the fiscal rectitude of the US Treasury, because China obviously is the largest holder of US Treasuries, and is now publicly calling for an alternative form of international reserve money because it's worried about the exposure to US mortgages, effectively. 
and, and, and the US government. That will mean that the cost of mortgages and credit in, in the future is bound to be higher than in the past. And the dollar is going to be a lot lower. So go out for those foreign holidays this summer. <laughs> Likely outcomes are either deflation and low growth as gradually uh, balance sheets get repaired and you go through a long, prolonged repair period, Japan type decade, or what might happen is if things start to improve and the, and the Fed and the Treasury can't bring themselves to start withdrawing the stimulus, you'll have inflation and very rapid depreciation. It might be that there's a middle course that's going to be charted. But uh, an analyst in the UK um, and I who, who email, we, we like using the analogy that this would be like landing a 747 on an aircraft carrier. This is going to be a very difficult thing to pull off. This is one final scary chart. This is from the Congressional Budget Office of fiscal outlays for the next decade. Uh, this is the amount of borrowing that is projected for this year, uh, 28. Sorry, this is percent of GDP. Sorry, 28% of GDP. This is outlays, revenues down here. This is what's going to be borrowed. Effectively, half the spending is going to be borrowed this year. The dotted line is the president's budget, as projected by the CBO. This would be without the budget. So even without the budget, there's going, they're effectively writing red ink for the rest of the decade in large quantity. But with the budget, this gap effectively doubles. So that the, the gap between these two projections, I think, is $4 trillion when you sum over this decade. Finally, to uh, give you some relief. Um, finally, I'm, I'm allowed, Dale is allowing me to give you something that's circulating in the financial markets. This is the, a pictorial explanation of the TARP. This is the Treasury Relief Fund Program. This was, so this is a, a dock in Ireland in 2004. A car has gone into the water. A crane is getting it out. Is that crane big enough? I'm not crying. I'm just watering up. Right, we're now on to questions. brave first one. Uh, I'm uh, Jonathan Acuff. I teach politics here at St. Anselm. Um, you'll have to refresh my memory on this one. I'm going to ask you a question about your institution, the IMF. And recently, uh, the United States and Europe uh, met to discuss whether we should increase the structural adjustment funds available to the IMF from, I believe, $250 billion, and I don't know whether that includes your ability to draw on private lending as well, but uh, to somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 billion. And the Europeans said no. The maximum we're willing to go to is 500 billion. Uh, let's say, for sake of argument, that the United States got its way, and we got 700 billion in structural adjustment to IMF. Would that make any difference in our ability to address this crisis globally? Yeah. What I haven't really addressed is the international dimensions of this. And so, some countries are in a much worse state. Like generally, smaller countries that had a big financial system, like Iceland. Uh, however, a, a lot of emerging market countries now are suffering very rapid withdrawals of foreign capital because of the concerns of the risk. And so there is pressure now, and already the IMF, having been sort of not very useful for the last three or four years, not having much to do, 
uh, is, all, is now all of a sudden uh, starting to lend a lot to countries, uh, emerging market countries. So there are several programs uh, been made to countries like Hungary, Iceland, and so on. Um, there is a concern that as the crisis deepens, the IMF is going to run out of the ability to lend. So the $250 billion uh, is the ability of, if effectively it's the lending that the member countries have already committed via the IMF. The, the money hasn't come through, it only gets called on uh, when it's lent out, uh, but it's the amount that the member countries have agreed to lend via the IMF. Um, there is a concern that with lots of programs being negotiated, and I'm not party to which countries are negotiating programs, this occasionally comes out into the press before it's announced, uh, that $250 billion is not going to be enough, is, is going to be exhausted later this year. And so doubling that commitment of lending through the IMF is meant to, first of all, give assurance that there will be enough uh, to fight the various fires in emerging markets, but also to give assurance to markets that there will be enough so that they don't have to worry that a particular country is not going to be able to borrow from the IMF and therefore will collapse and therefore I'll bring my money out now. So there's both a reassurance element of doubling the IMF's balance sheet and also a practical, this, this crisis could carry on rippling out and we, we do need this. Now, I'm not on that side of the, of the fund. <laughs> I just do financial stability. So um, I'm not cheerleading one way or the other saying this is a good or, good or a bad thing. It will give reassurance to markets that they don't have to worry that a particular country in Eastern Europe is going to be too late to the party to, to borrow from the IMF. So it, it should give some reassurance not to have to pull your money out from these countries. But, but whether 700 billion or 500 billion, uh, I'm not, not really in a position to say. 500 billion sounds a lot of money to me. Uh, Paul, I'm uh, Bill Martell. I'm at the uh, Fletcher School at Tufts. I'm also a resident here of Bedford and an alum, as a matter of fact. Uh, two obs uh, an observation and a question. Uh, you've been speaking for 90 minutes. The quality of the talk is every set of eyes has been locked on you for the last 90 minutes, and absolute quiet in the room. And that speaks to me of, of the depth of what you're saying. Two questions. What specifically would you recommend that the Obama administration do? And second, could you evaluate the responses of both President Obama, Secretary Geithner, and uh, Fred, uh, Fed Chairman uh, Bernanke? <laughs> and I would note that you're probably not non-attribution. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my word. Um, mm -hmm. This is where I have to worry about which line I'm going to cross. Um, I think the, the general advice from the US to other countries before this crisis and from external commentators and the fund itself is when you're dealing with banking crises, it's going to get very expensive and the longer you delay, the more expensive it's going to be. So if, if anything, err on the side of putting the fire out with everything you've got, even though it might, you may waste a bit rather than let the fires, risk that the fires carry on burning. So I think the problem thus far has been both administrations haven't really got ahead of the problem. They've been largely reactive and haven't wanted to admit that this is a bigger problem than it is. So in both administrations, you get the rhetoric, and even it was this week as well, that this is a liquidity problem, not a solvency problem. And that if we can provide enough liquidity to investors to buy these toxic assets, they'll bid up enough so that banks will sell them. And essentially, we'll find a clearing price, and then the banks can move on from there. Um, the problem is that the banks because of the, this lack of capital, can't afford to crystallize the losses that the markets say are coming. So the markets are forward-looking and saying, 
the banks are going to suffer lots of loss, therefore their market value is very low. And effectively, Citigroup stock, until this week, uh, was trading on an option value just on is there going to be a, a bailout by the government. Uh, whereas the banks, accountants, and regulators are essentially saying we only declare losses when we experience them. And we'll only, if there are loans on our books that we're not trading, we're, we're not marking these to market, we're just, if, if borrowers default, then we'll crystallize the loss. And so you've got the problem of the market is forward-looking and saying losses are big. Banks and bank regulation is saying backward-looking and saying the banks are still adequately capitalized. And we're having a tussle now because to raise more capital into the banks, you've got to go to the market if you're not going to the government. And so therefore the market is saying losses are coming, I'm not touching you with a barge pole. So it's then, do you take the hair shirt approach and admit that a lot of large institutions are seriously undercapitalized and say, if we can't afford to let them go insolvent, then this will mean the government owns all the equity and we wipe out shareholders and we own the bank. And then start breaking it up, selling it off when things are stabilized. And there are lots of debates about how much capital the, effectively the government now needs to put into the banking system relative to its market capitalization. But I think most outside observers would say there are sufficient losses still to come given the trend in unemployment, delinquencies, foreclosures, commercial mortgages that we haven't really seen come through yet, credit cards and so on, that unless private investors are given big incentives and subsidies, then effectively, if the government has to put capital in, it will own the majority of the shares in a lot of the banking system if you project those losses forward. So if we, I, I, I think the advice from other countries, how they've approached this, is acknowledge the losses. This may mean you've got to nationalize the banks. If you can't allow them to fail, you've got to take them over and then stabilize. It might take five years, then start selling them off again. But the longer you postpone that day of reckoning, the bigger the cost it's going to be. I personally would also say uh, what has to happen is you've got to start admitting the system is undercapitalized, not just banks, but households, companies, and so on, and start either doing swapping debt for equity, as you normally do in a corporate bankruptcy, but having to do that across the piece, mortgages, commercial property, you name it, or you're going to have bankruptcies down the line and losses are just going to accumulate. So th th this is a very difficult um, balancing act to take because the more you wear the hair shirt and admit that things are overextended, the more the risk is that you've got insolvent institutions dotted around the place. And the more you can't, with large institutions, you, the authorities have said we can't, we can't allow any of them to default. So <laughs> this is the problem with the deflating bubble. Um, it, it's going to, it might well burst as it deflates <laughs> and some very nasty things could happen as it bursts. But in a sense, the sooner it gets down, the quicker you're going to get back. So essentially, it's the choice between you, the nurse is giving you the choice of do you want the elastoplast off slowly or fast. And the problem is, if it's fast, you could bang your head in agony and kill yourself. But if it's slow, it's going to be 10 years of drawn out pain. <laughs>
That's, the, that's essentially the choice you're offering. And I think the authorities are choosing the slow plaster. Um, they have done, as we were talking about the lessons from the 1930s, the authorities in terms of Fed action, Treasury fiscal loosening, and so on, have been very, very fast in how interest rates have been cut, Fed action has been taken, and so on. And so they've done just about everything. Now, the Fed has gone all in. Quantitative easing, printing money, is just about the last thing a central bank can do. And it can just keep on doing this. But the more it keeps on doing it, the, the, the more concerns there will be about the currency going forward and inflation and so on. So the, the Fed has basically gone from just putting a, a, the, the one chip on the table to going all in very, very fast relative to previous episodes because it's worried about the 1930s repeat. My worry is that that debt mountain is so big that even with all that, it's not enough. The financial system has got too big relative to even the government's ability to guarantee and prop it up. We've got into the mindset of we can't take losses. We as savers can't bear absolute losses unless we're in the stock market. So because the system is levered so much and chronically undercapitalized, uh, chronically without that ability to take loss, the government's balance sheet is being used to prop up asset markets, but even the government's balance sheet is now coming to the limits of its ability to do it. <laughs>